Hello, and thanks for joining this Dolby Atmos Music Community session where we bring together experts from Dolby and the Dolby Music Community to share stories and experiences, exchange information, connect with you, and answer your questions. I'm Ben Guyver, Senior Creative Relations Manager with Dolby Laboratories based in Los Angeles. And in this session, we're gonna talk about some of the key concepts and flexible solutions for setting up your home studio in a 714 speaker config, how to tune your room for mixing, uh, and best practices for ensuring accurate translation. We'll also explore some headphone setup and binaural authoring tips. Uh, plus talk about a few ways to QC your mix on various devices. You can drop your questions into the questions window in the go-to menu or send them to musicwebinars at dolby.com. Uh, please also send along any comments or session ideas that you may have. We absolutely welcome your feedback. Uh, these are community sessions really designed to connect with you. So we'd love to have you involved and welcome your feedback. In the last session, we were joined by Atmos engineers and educators, Natalia Schlesinger and Robin Rumors from Abbey Road Institute in Miami for a conversation around how they've implemented Atmos education into their curriculum and the Atmos mix work they're doing for artists like Juanes and Sebastian Yatra. We also talked to Dolby Institute's John Scanlon about how the Institute team is furthering education and lowering the barrier to entry for Atmos music creation. And with that in mind, be sure to check out Pensado's Place episode 541 that also features Natalia, Robin, and John in conversation with our friends, Dave and Herb. Keep your eyes out for more Pensado's Place episodes featuring folks from the Dolby Atmos music community coming up soon on Dolby Institute's site and on Pensado's Place. Uh, we have a very cool look inside Abbey Road Institute and a piece coming up soon, so very much look forward to sharing that with you as well. John and the Dolby Institute team, they're really dedicated to empowering the next generation of creatives. They have produced the Dolby Atmos Music 101 video series, which you may be familiar with, featuring Luke Argilla, Maggie Tobin, and now Brian Pennington, which takes you all the way from studio setup to mixing for speakers and headphones to QC and to delivery. So we're excited to share the next chapter in that series today, which covers studio setup, speaker placement, room layout, and tuning. But before we jump into that, super excited to be joined by Dolby's content creation specialist, Maggie Tobin in San Francisco, and senior mix engineer, Luke Argilla in Los Angeles, to talk about the 101 video series and their tips for Atmos Music Mixing. Maggie, Luke, hello, thank you for joining. Hello, how are you? Hello, thank you. Good. Maggie, we'll start with you. You've done a lot of work in furthering research around headphone and binaural for immersive music in both your scholastic and your professional careers. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and the amazing work you've been doing for Dolby as a content creation specialist. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, so my background is pretty much in music. Um, I got like a just general music degree in my undergrad. I was like a vocal major. Um, but it took me a little while to figure out exactly what I wanted to do in the music field. And um, I kind of ended up really being interested in production and kind of being somebody who's in the background and helping other people um, kind of make their visions happen with their music. Um, so I ended up going to graduate school for music technology. And that was kind of where I discovered immersive music, which had never really been on my radar before. Um, but what definitely stuck out to me like at that time as sort of a limitation was, you know, how do we get this kind of experience out to a bunch of people? Um, am I just mixing for like a small population that is able to have like a really big speaker um, configuration in their home? Um, so I just always thought this would be such an amazing experience, but who, you know, who is going to hear this? Um, and so I discovered Dolby Atmos and was actually really interested in it um, at first because of the headphone experience and the idea that um, not only was it sort of prioritizing making sure that you could derive a really quality headphone experience from an immersive mix that then could go out to lots of people, but also that I as a mixer could mix that way and not need to have a really um, extensive setup in my home. And I was in New York at the time. And so I did not have enough space for that, <laughs> for sure, um, cost aside. So anyway, so I ended up doing a master's thesis on headphone mixing and translation to speakers and was lucky enough then to um, be able to intern at Dolby. Um, and now I'm a content creation specialist with the SoundTech research team here. 
Um, and so I would say that overall, um, my work has focused a lot on the headphone experience and trying to prove, improve the experience for mixers so that they can be more sure that their mix is going to translate well to speakers um, if they want to take like a headphone first approach. Um, and then also to Im help improve the consumer experience as well, um, among other things. And my role, I guess, on the team would be just to provide more of a music production perspective um, and be able to kind of test out things internally before we send them out to um, people to test out externally. So, yeah. That's awesome. Congrats. What a perfect fit and what a <laughs> perfect time to like be approaching headphones from a music perspective now that it's so available and accessible to people everywhere. That, that's really cool. Um, Luke, you come from a musician, DJ and producer background. You've been working in Atmos for quite a few years. Can you talk a little bit about what you do with Dolby Atmos Music uh, for Dolby and within the creative community as well? Yeah, so my role has has recently kind of shifted. For the, for the first several years, I was doing production work with different mixers and artists, um, shepherding them through the process from uh, starting an Atmos mix, learning the tools, and mixing their music in Atmos. And in more recent years, I've been shifting into doing more support and education and training. Um, you know, in the early days, there weren't very many people mixing in Atmos, and so it was very new to everyone. And today there's a lot of people mixing in Atmos and that's growing all the time. So um, it's been really cool to see that happen. And, and it's been really fun to be able to show people the tools, get them up and running and help them through their creative process. So Maggie, your videos on headphone workflows for Atmos Music are great, not only for getting going, but for giving people some creative theory around the how and the why. You've done the 101 series, you've done some cool stuff with Women's Audio Mission and, and other outlets. So kind of on that, what are your tips for getting going, like getting up and running on mixing Atmos Music in headphones and maybe how should mixers prepare themselves? So to get started mixing in headphones, um, you just need a laptop, the Dolby Atmos production suite and a pair of headphones that you like to use. And with that, you can just monitor a spatial mix binaurally straight out of the renderer. Um, so my process kind of for approaching headphone mixing is I first start, and you know, this is this could be probably somebody's process for like speaker mixing as well, but this is just the way that I approach it. And I do about 80% of my mixing on headphones. Um, so normally I'll start with kind of like panning and trying to figure out where I want to place things in the spatial sound field. Um, and then after that is when I'll like add EQ and kind of make sure my balance is correct and add a variety of other sort of more timbral changes. Um, and the reason for that is because um, sometimes timbre can be kind of dependent on space and where you place things. And so I want to make sure that before I make any EQ adjustments or balance adjustments that anything that might naturally happen because of the spatialization um, is already addressed before I make those changes. Um, and then last is when I'll add in things like reverb and delays. Um, I use some really fantastic like immersive reverb and delay plugins um, like Stratus 3D um, and then delay wise slapper, which is really incredible, but there's also ways to adapt stereo tools to this kind of thing. So if that's what you like to use, there's definitely ways to implement those in an Atmos workflow. Um, and then last thing I do usually is add headphone metadata, which is a really cool sort of headphone specific feature in Atmos where you can sort of, um, choose the distance that you want objects to be um, from the listener. And that's a really great way to kind of diversify the headphone sound field and like add a little bit of depth and contrast. And you can, it helps certain things stick out a little bit more than others. Um, so it's definitely don't skip that in your workflow. It's a really great tool. Um, so like I said, I do about 80% of my mixing on headphones and then I'll usually do a speaker check after that. And the kind of adjustments I'm making tend to be, you know, maybe a little bit of adjustment to the base, maybe some panning adjustments, especially when it comes to elevation, because there can kind of be a fine line um, on speakers between when things sound correctly elevated to you and when they start to kind of sound like they're sort of uh, just coming out of the height speakers. And so I, you know, from my, uh, you know, experience going back and forth between headphones and speakers, I kind of have a good idea of where that limit is for me now, but, um, you know, just something to be aware of if you're checking something you did on headphones on speakers for the first time. Um, so yeah, other than that, just maybe some quick balance things. 
Um, but I've generally been pretty happy with the translation between headphones and speakers. And I feel like the more and more that I get to experience that translation, the more that I um, know what I should be doing on headphones so that something sounds good on speakers, um, which has been really great. Um, let's see, like otherwise other tools or like gear that I use headphone wise, I'm mostly mixing on Sennheiser HD 600s. They have like a really transparent frequency response. And so it really helps me know, be like trusting of the balance that I'm um, achieving in my mix. Um, and then I will also do also some work on uh, biodynamic DT 770s. They're just also a pretty commonly used mixing headphone, um, a little bit more of a high mid boost. So that's kind of like a different perspective. And then for me personally, I feel like I get a really good sub frequency response on those headphones. And so I think for me, they've been really helpful for like checking bass response and getting that balance before I check everything on speakers. Um, and then last, I'll do a check on AirPods and uh, just like export like an MP4 file and check that on my mobile device to see what that kind of translation sounds like as well. Um, but yeah, so as I've as I said, generally, I've like overall been pretty happy with the translation I've been getting. That's great. Thanks. Those are some great tips. And um, Luke, kind of on the flip side, sort of speaking to the flexibility of the Dolby Atmos music ecosystem and, and systems and setups that are that are possible. I mean, you're you've worked in pro studios for a long time, but you've recently set up your home studio. How did you kind of do that? What were you looking to achieve there? Um, and were there any challenges maybe you, you based and setup you were able to solve for? As you know, uh, setting up my home studio is a little bit of a um, forced function because it was right when the pandemic started, right? So um, our home office in San Francisco, where I was at the time, was shutting down. And so um, the studios that I was working in were not going to be available to me. So I had to quickly come up with some solutions and work with the gear that I had. Um, um, available to me. So also I was, I was in a rented apartment, so I couldn't really exactly mount speakers or drill into walls the way that somebody might be doing if they were designing or implementing into a space that they owned or that they had full control over. So I had to get a little creative there and um, I used some trust systems and um, some, you know, creative ways to kind of rig that so that it would be secure and safe. And um, and I had some Genelec 8020Ds with some clamps and arms so I could position the speakers overhead. Those were obviously the trickiest ones to to install um, and get get positioned correctly. But um, yeah, I came up with some some solutions and got it up and running, and then was able to tune the room with the help of Sebastian, who is um, one of our great colleagues, and. We had to do a couple different tunings, but eventually we got it right. And um, yeah, was up and running in that room for a good, almost a little over two years, I suppose. And recently, just last week, finally had to break it down and truck all the gear down to LA where I'm gonna be setting up a, another room here. Um, and I think I'm gonna be doing things a little bit differently here, um, where I think I might actually go ahead and maybe mount some speakers on the wall. I figure that I can maybe uh, do that. And then when it's time to move on, I can maybe, you know, fill, fill those with with whatever needs to be done to, to repair them. But yeah, so um, it's, it's a real fun challenge and um, I love that kind of thing. So it's always, it's always a good time. Nice. And you're doing most of your mix work um on speakers in a 714 config, and then you're kind of going and, and testing the translation to headphones. What's your process for, for sort of doing that, and um, how do you kind of work through through that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that I do all my mixing on, on speakers because the headphone translation is so important, and um, I definitely do um, place a lot of value and weight on, on how things sound in the headphones, and um, obviously, when you're doing your binaural um, mixing, you have to be really careful and um, pay a lot of attention to the binaural settings that you choose for each instrument and each sound. Um, 
I think that's one of the things that a lot of folks, when they start mixing in Atmos, they aren't necessarily um, aware of the importance of that. And it's really crucial for translation when, um, when listening on headphones for, for the binaural settings. So I always recommend to everyone to make sure that you, you know, solo every sound and audition the different binaural settings. Yes, you wanna maybe choose something to be farther away or um, closer to the listening position in the environment. But I also think it's really important to place a lot of value in how those binaural settings impact the sonic um, quality of that sound because they do have slightly different impacts um, on which binaural setting you choose. So, um, so yeah, I place a lot of, of value on that. Headphones are where a lot of people are going to be hearing this stuff also. So, so yeah, I think there's, there's an equal amount of importance that I place on the speaker mix as well as the headphone um, uh, experience. Nice. And, and from a workflow perspective too, you've done a lot of work with the Dolby Atmos music panner. Um, not just for dance music, but across all sorts of genres. What do you what do you feel are kind of the benefits to using that tool, and how have you kind of seen it evolve over time? I've seen it evolve quite a bit. Yeah, I remember when I first started, um, kind of working with that panner as as an artist before I even worked at Dolby. They brought me in to get opinions. They were bringing in different artists from different um, styles and genres, and um, yeah, it was way more rudimental at that point and to see how far it's come. Um, there's the new version where you can have, you know, if you have a stereo object, you can have the left and right um, signal not uh, mirrored to each other anymore, which is really great. Um, that's been an option in Pro Tools native panning for a while, so it's good to see that in the plugin. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool features and functions in the the panner plugin. In fact, I have always leaned heavily on that versus the native panning in Pro Tools. Um, I think just because that was how I started and learned to mix in Atmos. So it's always been my main workflow is to use the, the panner plugin. Um, obviously, the native panning in, in Pro Tools is really powerful as well as um, now in Logic and um, in Cubase more recently. But uh, I love the Panner plugin. The sequencer is amazing. If you if you want to have um, a rhythmic pattern, you can you can achieve that really easily and quickly. Um, you can set up different um, presets, which I like to do. I have a list of presets that I that I have in there, so I can just you know quickly um, program different patterns or movements in there. Um, yeah, and you know, I like the UI. I think it's just a, a, a you know slightly different vibe to work with it than it is with the native panning as well in Pro Tools, which I, I do most of my mixing in Pro Tools. Um, so yeah, I like it a lot. Um, I think the the new Logic integration is amazing. Um, I have yet to to dig in with the with the Cubase integration, but um, I'm really excited for that too. I know a lot of great producers that work in Cubase. So I think that's going to be a really um, valuable advancement for a lot of folks. Nice. Yeah. And you touched on it there, kind of the the advancement of the content creation tools into different DAWs, the flexibility, the accessibility, um, the binaural settings plugin, Maggie, has evolved, right? We're on version 1.1.2 now. Um, are, are there any, is there anything unique about that version that you wanted to highlight or that you would give advice to people on on how to use or in general uh, headphone workflow integration into any of the other um, workstations that you find to be particularly interesting? Well, I can probably just offer some general advice on using headphone metadata in your binaural mixes. Um, so first, like Luke was saying, it I do think it's important to kind of cycle through each setting on different sounds because it's really going to be the character and the frequency content of each sound that ultimately um, decides which setting you're going to use. Um, but just some general rules that I kind of usually abide by. Um, if I want something to sound pretty clear and pretty defined and really kind of pop out of the mix a little bit more, I tend to um, set it to near because um, then it'll be a little bit closer. 
uh, sound a little bit more like a point source, at least to my ears. Um, and then if you're working with a sound that is just naturally kind of diffuse, um, sort of atmospheric, then that could be like a good candidate uh, for something that for putting it in far. Um, so, but overall, I just really would recommend kind of diversifying settings to get some depth and contrast um, if you can, but you kind of have to balance that again with uh, the way, uh, as Luke was saying, that these settings impact timbre. Um, so yeah, so just be aware of that balance. Um, and then sort of another thing that guides me a lot of times is frequency content. So for my main role probably in that regard is um, for low frequency sounds, I tend to like go with near. I really wouldn't choose like mid or far for those just because once you start to like add reverberate information to low frequency sounds, it really kind of um, reflects like all over the place and just be builds up a little bit too much. Um, and also those kinds of sounds you tend to want to be uh, quite defined and crisp anyway. Uh, so that's kind of my one of the rules that I would go with in terms of frequency content. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a little overview of some of the rules I follow myself. <laughs> That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. And, you know, Luke, with things growing so quickly and so many people trying to understand and learn how to mix Dolby Atmos music, you're connecting with a lot of them out there in the field and in studios. What advice are you giving new mixers or experienced mixers that are maybe learning how to mix an Atmos um, out there, out and about? I think first, most of the questions that I'm fielding are technical questions, which are, you know, um, kind of obstacles to the creative workflow. So, you know, a lot of what I'm helping people with is the technical side. Um, as far as creative advice, I think the best advice I can give is to just experiment and have fun. Um, Atmos is, is a really huge palette to paint on. And so, um, you know, everybody's going to approach it a little differently, especially at first. Everybody wants to try new things, which is really important because you have to, you have to try a lot of things to to land in a place where you feel like you're getting a really great cohesive mix. And I think most of the mixers that I deal with are are you know are some of the some of the best around. But everybody from the top uh, mixers to to you know students or people who are just starting out, um, you know, it's all about respecting the music and and finding a way to enhance the song versus, um, you know, just doing something for the sake of having, you know, a flashy pan move, you know, it's really about um, doing what's going to be best for the music, what's going to enhance it, um, and what's going to give the best experience for the listener, you know, so that's the kind of advice that I like to give is just have fun um, and do what feels natural. A lot of the times with Atmos, um, the instrument or the song is going to kind of tell you what what to do or or it's going to feel natural for a certain instrument to be placed in a certain place or for it to, to have a certain kind of um, movement or to have you know no movement at all or just to be in the stereo field and you just have to listen and um, pay attention and do what feels right i think that's my best advice that's great Thank you both for sharing your wisdom and knowledge and, and insight here today. Viewers can download the 90 day trial of the Dolby Atmos production suite with the renderer version 372 at professional.dolby.com. You can also get the music panner version 1.2 and the binaural settings plugin 1.1.2 there as well. Um, for new Atmos rooms that are coming online, uh, if you haven't yet, be sure to use our music studio onboarding form to submit your studio info and you'll receive back guidance on design and implementation layout and dart diagrams there and you can connect directly with our dedicated studio teams for support be sure to check out our expanding knowledge base faqs and user forums as well with a ton of resources and info at the pro site and also at dolby.com institute it's truly growing with input and questions from the folks out in the community so thank you for your contributions there I um, also want to quickly mention that Dolby will be at NAMM this year, at booth 15009 in ACC North. Uh, we'll be hosting a variety of demos and conversations featuring Dolby Technologies and folks from around the creative community. We'll be showing some new products there, so be sure to stop by and say hi. Um, and with that, we'll check out the new studio setup and tuning videos with Luke and Brian. We'll come back for Q&A. Um, 
this may start somewhat basic for folks that are more advanced on what it takes for studio setup and, and placement, but it quickly does progress into more advanced tuning and design concepts uh, with Brian on the back end. So um, be sure to drop your questions into the question box in the go to menu here. And once again, thank you, Maggie and Luke. Thank you. Thank you. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to set up your home studio for mixing Dolby Atmos music in a 714 speaker configuration. We'll take a look at some of the gear I'm using, including my speakers and monitor controller. We'll cover some of the best practices for speaker placement, room layout, and go over recommendations you can use when you're setting up your own studio for Atmos music. We'll also be joined by Dolby's senior applications engineer, Brian Pennington, for a look at best practices and techniques for tuning. Brian has tuned Atmos music rooms of all sizes and configurations. Be sure to check out the entire Atmos Music Creation 101 video series for in-depth tutorials for Atmos music creation. We're gonna focus on my 714 system here, which is the recommended minimum configuration for Atmos Music speaker monitoring. The guidance provided here will allow you to create mixes that can scale up to larger venues and all the way down to headphones, while offering you the greatest chance of achieving reliable translation across all outlets and devices. This includes playback environments such as headphones, soundbars, smart speakers, mobile devices, home theater setups, and automobiles. There are some general guidelines and best practices to keep in mind while configuring your Atmos Music Studio. The basic concepts we'll look at here are room size considerations, speaker specifications and placement, signal routing, and room tune. Starting with room size, the optimal Atmos Mix Room would be 18 feet wide by 21 feet long and 10 feet high. But for those of us with home studios and working with less than perfect room dimensions, you will generally want your Atmos music room to be a minimum of 10 feet wide by 11 and a half feet long and with your ceilings at at least eight feet high. These specifications will be optimal for speaker configuration and allow for proper dispersion. Here's how these measurements are taken. For the minimum layout length, 11 and a half feet is the distance measured from the center speaker baffle to your rear surround line. For the minimum layout width, 10 feet is the distance between your side surround speakers. And finally, for the minimum layout height, eight feet is the distance measured from the floor at mixed position to the acoustic center of your overhead speakers. Let's get into speaker specifications. In a 714 speaker configuration, you'll have seven horizontal plane speakers around you. These are also known as your surround speakers. These include left, right, and center, also referred to as LCR, left and right side surrounds, left and right rear surrounds, a subwoofer channel, also known as your LFE, and four top surround speakers, which can often be referred to as overhead or height speakers. It's important that your speakers at all locations are matched in frequency response and volume output in order to enable a balanced full range reproduction throughout the mix room. Here are some best practices for placement of the speakers. When measured from the floor to the speaker's acoustic center, the front, side, and rear speakers should be at ear level for a seated mixer, approximately 1.2 meters or four feet. In a 914 or 916 configuration, there would be additional wide speakers located between the left and right and the side surrounds. In the renderer, we have the option to change and modify our monitoring configurations. These options include, but are not limited to, 914, 714-7151, 2.0 or traditional stereo, and other configurations. For placement of my front and rear speakers, I use traditional speaker stands. My LCR are Focal Twin 6BE, and my rear surrounds are Genelec 8020Ds. 
I also use the same Genelec for my overhead speakers and have them mounted to a crossbar with speaker clamps. I used standard lighting truss to section out my room and create rigging points. This allowed me to avoid drilling into my ceiling to mount the speakers and still achieve the recommended overhead heights. My side surrounds are clamped into the truss on either side of the mix position. I'm using the renderer within the Dolby Atmos production suite and tuning my room via the JBL Intonado 24. Within this interface, I'm not only tuning my speakers, but I'm also adjusting the time delays. It's very important to match speaker capabilities in all locations, but it's not uncommon to use smaller surround and overhead speakers as I've done here, as long as they reach the target SPL, have ample headroom, and meet specifications. My sub is a Focal Sub 6, and my LFE and bass management settings are also controlled in the JBL Intonado 24. Think of your LFE or low frequency effects as your sub crossover. And with Atmos, you have a lot of creative control over this part of the frequency spectrum. Many of the DAWs that now support Dolby Atmos workflows have an LFE feed that can be utilized directly from the multi-channel panner. While this is useful in some circumstances, we definitely recommend using a dedicated send from the channel to a low-pass filtered LFE bus. Let's take a look at how I've configured my signal flow for my 714 setup. Starting with my DAW, which on any given day could be Logic, Ableton, Pro Tools, or any of the other Atmos enabled platforms, I would set my playback engine to the Dolby Audio Bridge. This may be different if you're using the mastering suite on a secondary machine. From there, within the renderer, my input is also set to the Dolby Audio Bridge, while my output is my main audio interface, which is the Apollo X16. From the Apollo, the signal goes out via a DB25 cable connecting directly to the JBL Intonado 24. This is where I adjust the tuning of each speaker using the parametric EQ system, as well as making small adjustments for time delay considerations. The output from my Intonado is a DB25 to XLR fan out cable, which feeds signal directly to my speakers. Calibrating your room refers to adjusting the output level and frequency response of each speaker according to the acoustics of the room. There are a variety of speaker manufacturers that you can choose from, but keep in mind that a Dolby Atmos mix room should be capable of reproducing 85 decibels with an extra 20 dB of headroom from each speaker to the mix position. When calibrating speaker reference levels, the renderer will send minus 20 dBFS pink noise signal to a single speaker. We adjust its output level in our monitor system until the speaker produces 85 dB SPL at the mixed position. Additionally, we use EQ to tune the frequency response, and this process is repeated for all full range speakers. For more information on speaker calibration, please visit learning.dolby.com. The Dolby Atmos Music Studio's Best Practices Guide outlines key areas that benefit from room-specific guidance and lays out the expectations for commercial studios as well as private mix rooms. Another great support tool for new Atmos Music Studios is the Dolby Music Studio onboarding form. Here you can enter your room dimensions and receive guidance and feedback from our studio teams on implementation and designs. Your local reseller will have options for studio configurations at various price points and can work with you on implementation. Check out our list of resellers here. Now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Brian Pennington, who will share with us some of his best practices for Atmos Music Room Tuning. Hello everyone. My name is Brian Pennington and I'm a Senior Field Applications Engineer at Dolby Laboratories. Setting up your studio can be daunting, so I'd like to talk about some of the things that you should consider when designing and implementing a Dolby Atmos Music Mix Space. Many of these ideas are in the Dolby Atmos Music Studios Best Practices document found at professionalsupport.dolby.com. There are a few major points that I like to pass along to people when setting up their rooms for mixing. Basically, a list of things that can really affect how your mixes translate from your mix space to the consumer's listening experience, as well as other professional studios. 
One of the first things that I like to speak to people about is the size of the room. You wanna make sure it's not too big and not too small. Luke has already gone over some of the minimum and recommended sizes, but I can't stress enough that bigger is not always better. You wanna make sure that the room is not too big to turn out a good mix. One of the things that we do consider is shape of the room. We wanna make sure that you're probably more in a rectangular room, less in a square room, because you can load yourself up with acoustic problems due to the squareness of the room. If you can help it, also try to orient yourself so that you're on the long axis of the room as opposed to the wide axis of the room. One of the next topics that we talk about are usually speaker selection. We try not to endorse any particular speaker manufacturer as Atmos works with all of them. Keep in mind that price does not necessarily denote quality. There are quality speakers at all budget levels that can work with your budget and your studio environment. We also have a tool named the Dart, the Dolby Atmos Room Design Tool. It's helpful for choosing speakers that are right for your space. The Dart allows you to put your room dimensions in to a spreadsheet style form, and it calculates where your speakers should go in your existing space. It also allows you to play around with different models of speakers and different combinations of speakers to see what works for your space for both power handling and SPL. When I show up to a studio to tune a room, there are four main topics that I think that people should keep in mind. Speaker aiming, SPL, setting delays, and EQ. I ask people to follow the recommended speaker placements in the best practices document, available at professionalsupport.dolby.com. It may seem obvious, but we ask people to aim the speakers at the mix position. And when you aim your speakers, aim them in an over-the-shoulder style that allows for a wider sweet spot. The next topic that I like to talk about is SPL and level calibration. You're going to want a good SPL meter that can do C weighting and A weighting with both fast and slow responses. You want C weighting for speakers with similar but flat responses down to 40 Hertz. You're gonna choose A weighting for speakers with disparate uneven responses. A weighting is a band limited measurement that discounts low frequency content which can be very uneven depending on the speaker's location in the room and its overall response. A weighting can give you a closer match between speakers if you do not have the ability to tune the room with an RTA, but you're still going to want to check it with C weighting once you've done all of your final checks to make sure that they're closer to each other. To match the levels in all of your speakers, start by generating noise from the renderer's speaker calibration window. Clicking on each individual speaker representation you'll hear noise out of the different speakers. Make all of these speakers the same volume. The relative volume is the more important aspect here. We want them all to be the same, except for the sub, which should end up around five or six dB louder than your center channel. 85 dB is the recommended level for professional studio environments. Usually, this is only for final checks and reviews though. Mixing levels are quite often lower. 70, 75, 80 is common in smaller spaces and home studios. It's comfortable for a long day of working and can yield a closer match to your LKFS measurement targets, depending on your mixing style. If you find yourself missing your LKF measurement targets on a consistent basis, change your monitoring level so that you're going to more reliably hit your target without having to adjust it at the end with loudness correction tools. The next topic that I usually talk about is setting delays. Setting delays can be as simple or as complex as you feel they need to be. They can be adjusted physically or electronically. Electronically is usually easier if available and yields a more refinable result. Physical adjustment can be very cost-effective and practical, but it's hard to repeat because you're physically moving speakers around in the room. Measurements can be made a few different ways. I tend to use transfer functions in SMART to measure delays when I tune rooms because it gives me very precise results. But measurements can be done with a tape measure and a notebook. The method for measuring delay times is to measure the distance from a single point at the mix position to each speaker. This can be easier to achieve with a laser disto or a laser tape, especially for the overheads. But a physical tape measure works just as well. Take the longest measurement as the furthest distance in time. This is usually going to either be the rear speakers or one of the overheads in most rooms. 
This becomes your base distance or base time. Calculate the time delay based on the distance to each speaker. You do this by using the speed of sound, which is 1,125 feet per second. That translates to roughly 1.125 feet per millisecond. You add the delay to the earlier arriving speakers until all of the speakers are arriving at the same time at the mix position. Setting delay timing can really tighten up your mix. You'll notice that things like reverb start to sound way more cohesive and that pans will start to sound more consistent and constant as they move around the room. Less like the sound is moving from one speaker to another and more like a ball of audio just moving around the room. You'll want to be as precise as your equipment allows. For instance, the renderer only allows for whole millisecond adjustments in the speaker calibration page. It may not be the best device for delay adjustment, but it may be all you have. Monitor controllers like the Grace 908 have stepped values that are slightly more precise. Monitor controllers like the JBL Intonato can make adjustments in the tenths of a millisecond. And monitor controllers like the Avid Matrix with an SPQ card, the Avid Matrix Studio, the BSS Blue Speaker controllers, and QSYS from QSC have the capabilities for adjustments down to hundreds of milliseconds on every channel. The next topic I'd like to talk about is acoustic room tuning and EQ. These are sometimes confused as the same topic, but are two entirely separate concepts. There are a few things that EQ cannot fix and should be looked at before any speaker EQing is attempted. Things like bass trapping to avoid low end buildup in the room. Corner foam wedges and round diffusers work well to alleviate this style of problem. Then there's reverb time, which can greatly affect your mix translations. RT60 times of around 0.5 to 0.8 seconds are typical of most well-behaved mix rooms. 60-40 or 70-30 is a good rule of thumb to follow when figuring out how much absorptive surfaces versus reflective surfaces you should plan for in your mix space. That includes floors, walls, and ceilings. Too much reflective energy can lead to smearing in nodes with a distinct lack of clarity, but too much deadness can lead to reverbs that disappear in your space only to return with a vengeance in other rooms. Room modes can create nodes at the mix position that no EQ can reliably fix. Resonators and tuned absorbers can absorb some of that energy to help alleviate the standing wave energy that creates such phenomena. There are plenty of DIY tutorials out there that can help solve this kind of problem. But if this all seems like magic to you, hire an acoustician. Rely on their knowledge and expertise to help you fix acoustic problems in your room. I feel like money spent on this type of help will be more valuable than any piece of gear you will ever buy. Rooms with too many acoustical problems will ultimately mean your mixes will have a hard time translating. There are two main goals for EQing speakers to make the speakers sound more like each other and to affect a better translation of your mixes from your mix room to the consumer listening environment and to other professional studios. When tuning your room, use what's available to you and start with the built-in speaker filters. Set the filters to match the conditions that each speakers are placed in. For instance, you can drop the bass a notch if it's against the wall. You can drop the bass another notch if it's in the corner. Try to use the filters to match the timbres around the room. One technique is to play pink noise from the Dolby Atmos renderer in rotate mode to pick out which speaker positions might sound too bright or too bassy and make adjustments as you hear them. You can also use your monitor controller's EQ function if it has one. If you're using the Dolby Atmos mastering suite, you can use the built-in EQ as your last option. It's a really good third octave EQ with some bulk filter shaping at the top and bottom, but it can add strain to a computer that might possibly be running on the edge. If you have the capability, knowledge, and opportunity, tune your speaker system with a set of microphones and an RTA. A single microphone is not necessarily good enough for an accurate response of readings below around 500 Hertz. Also, a single mic position is not necessarily good enough to accurately predict or identify room modes that could be affecting the timbre of a particular speaker. 
Systems like Smart allow for averaging of multiple microphones at once for a more comprehensive picture of your speaker responses. We want you to try and adhere to the Dolby Atmos Music Curve discussed in the Dolby Atmos Music Best Practices document found at professionalsupport.dolby.com. I'd like to wrap up our conversation with four pro tips. First, we'd love it if you would cover your speakers. Creating a room where you can't see your speakers will improve your mixes because you'll stop mixing for speakers and start mixing for the space that you're in. Second, we want you to tighten up your room acoustics with improvements. If your room is fundamentally flawed, your mixes will be too. Third, take a field trip. Mix stuff in your room and then go see how it translates to other known Atmos spaces. This is especially useful if you are going to work with a particular pro studio for purposes of reviews with clients. And lastly, if your mixes are not translating well, work hard to improve your setup so that those mixes do translate better to the known Atmos playback systems. If they sound wrong in someone else's room, you know you have some homework to do. Thanks for watching. I hope these videos have helped you set up your Atmos mix room, and I can't wait to hear your Dolby Atmos music mixes out in the wild. I'm very pleased to be joined by Brian Pennington, Maggie Tobin, and Luke Argilla. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you. Glad to be here. Sorry, folks, one moment. Oh, so we had some Q&A come in and I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for submitting their Q&A. We got quite a lot of questions, quite a few um, pre-submitted questions and live questions as well. Um, starting off, Brian, with you, um, with speaker calibration, a question from Santiago is, what are the most affordable solutions available if my monitor speakers don't have a DSP calibration system? Uh, what are you, say, say that one more time just so I'm, Run it yeah, my head. you mentioned a couple of the uh, monitor options, uh, controller and tuning options uh, that are available in the video. Um, Santiago is asking, what are some of the more affordable options or maybe the breadth of options that are out there um, for tuning my system if I don't have um, something on board already? I mean, some of the more, I unfortunately, I don't know price points for a lot of the gear that we use, but I do know that there are uh, a number of different um, not necessarily all in one versions there are things like the dbx controllers uh the uh, behringer actually makes funny enough uh a something called the deq 2496 which is a stereo eq with a lot of filter options they're not crazy expensive um uh even the the intonato is not a bad product for for the price uh from what i understand so there are a number of different options out there you just got to do some research as long as they offer some eq uh, on every channel some correction uh, that's kind of what you're looking for and it's really about uh channel count there are certain controllers out there that are, that are just you know kind of a a mute solo uh dim switch type thing like the like as far as i know the spl controller but um uh, i'm not 100 percent sure on the the capabilities of that one or its future so there are there are tons. Unfortunately, we could do that all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maggie, let's go to you on this one. Um, how is your experience with the PHDRF um, app application? Yeah. Um, yeah. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, this is a mobile app that's currently in beta that allows you to, or uh, basically scan your head and your ears and it will output um, personalized HRTFs that you can use with the Dolby Atmos production suite. Um, so, I mean, I first want to say that I'm a big fan of the default um, HRTS that come with it already, and um, I would recommend, if you haven't already, updating to 
version 372, um, which is the, I believe the newest version of DAFs, um, which has an even more updated uh, default HRTF um, set that everybody can use. Um, but yes, I have used the PHRTF um, mobile capture app and I've had a lot of success with it. I think that you get a lot more resolution in the higher frequencies, you get a lot more spatial localization resolution, um, things sound more externalized to me over headphones, um, objects sound more discreet, there's like less spatial smear. And so all, you know, all of the, all of those things are going to help you with um, headphone to speaker translation. So highly recommend if you haven't checked that out yet. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Mark asks, and we'll direct this one to you, Luke, and, and maybe to you, Maggie, um, on the subject of LFB, how do you creatively treat LFB in your Atmos mix, knowing it's going to be delivered um, by music services on headphones? Um, well, <clears throat> like we said in the video, um, definitely recommend putting a low pass filter on there. Um, that will ensure that you're only getting the frequencies that you want into the LFE channel, which are, you know, somewhere below 90 to 80 hertz, and maybe even do a high pass to get rid of some of that extra um, extra information, maybe like 10 or 15 or even 20 and, and down. Um, and that we found is, is, is a good formula for consistency in, in the LFE signal. Um, Brian, Ali asks um, on room tuning, what kind of mics should I use to tune and measure my room? Well, there are a few different microphones that are fairly cost effective. Uh, I mean, you could go anywhere from you know, $5,000 Echo Pacific microphones, you know, things like that are made for measurements, being case, so on and so forth. What I use is the Bayer Dynamic MM1s, which are not crazy expensive. They're in the three to $400 range, I think. Um, Audix TM1, uh, iSimCon, EMX 7150s. Those are all somewhat budget microphones that are in a, you know, $300 range that allow for a fairly flat response, which is what you're really looking for. Uh, and uh, if you're using multiple microphones, a really good match between the different uh, microphones that you're using. Awesome, great, thanks. Um, Esteban asks, again, on binaural translation here, what are your recommendations maybe for from Maggie for um, how to treat the mid and side signals on the binaural mix from stereo um, in terms of not losing some of the um, the, the timbral effect uh, as you're mixing in those areas? Yes, um, yeah, that's a good question. So my answer to this would be that the effects, I, I think the effect that uh, he's talking about has a lot to do with the character of the stems. So for example, if we're using like stereo stems that have a lot of like MS information baked into them, um, you know, that MS information a lot of times, which is spatial, um, is still gonna be like confined to the binaural um, sort of point places that you pan that stereo stem um, in the Atmos mix. Uh, so my first recommendation, just like to anyone, would be to use mono objects or at least dry stereo objects if you have um, if you have those available to you and just kind of reprocess them with spatial information that's more um, attuned to like the spatial like Atmos environment, and then you'll probably get a more natural response there. Um, I know that's not totally possible for everybody in the industry today. So if you do have stereo stems to work with, um, you know, it's a good thing to kind of pay attention to the panning that's baked into them. Maybe if you have something that's more like hard panned, like super decorrelated and left and right, that can be a good thing to kind of bring out into the room a little bit more. I find that putting stuff kind of right behind me, almost between like the side and rear speakers on the sides is a pretty good approximation of the kind of width you get with like hard panning and stereo. So that could be an option. Um, and then, you know, it it's also good if, you know, if maybe you don't have anything that's like super hard panned like that, um, just like good old like MS processing with things like Wave Center, I've had a lot of um, luck with, and then you can really separate out the mid and side signals and uh, have a little bit more freedom to move those around, do some different processing with them. Uh, and then, you know, just like simple stereo widening as well can be helpful. So I use Waves S1 a lot for that, and I've had a lot of success with that. So, uh, yeah, so I hope that kind of helps answer that question. I don't know if, Luke, you have any other tips to add on to that. 
No, I, th I think you covered, excuse me. <clears throat> I think you covered it um, really well. Um, I, I use a lot of those same techniques, especially um, sometimes separating the mid signal from the side signal. So that way, if you wanna have, say the phantom mono, phantom center signal, more pulled into the Atmos field and keep the the um the sides really wide. You can you can achieve that, which I found is really effective on certain types of sounds and instruments. Great, thanks, Brian. This one's for you, and it's a question that we get pretty pretty frequently in different ways. But uh, Troy is asking. Um, he first states that the market's full of home stereo receivers that have power to um, support and decode Atmos. Could one of these receivers be used as an audio interface? Um, I mean, that's not always the easiest thing. There are a, a number of different ways that you could try and interface with a with a receiver via HDMI or or uh, via RCA inputs. But quite often, HDMI's only transfer 7.1. Um, as PCM audio, the 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 preamp inputs are usually uh, only 7.1 as well. More often than not, the the reality of using a home theater receiver has been that it's more trouble than it's worth. Uh, we've tried some people have tried it, and it it ultimately ran into a lot of problems. Even just because you're using the RCAs, you get a lot of hums and buzzes. You get uh, uh, headroom issues, uh, things like that. So we tend not to to recommend it, but um, you know there's if you've got enough amp channels and a way to deal with it, uh, you might be able to get it to work, but I've, it's not been something that we've been very successful with. Gotcha, thank you. Um, from a creative perspective, Luke and Maggie, Abiola asks, how do you, and you've touched on this a little bit, but how do you approach the use of EQ reverb and compression on your mix and do you have any other favorite go-to plugins? I think you've mentioned a few of them, but any other tips there? uh luke do you want to start with that <laughs> um sure uh so let's see um how do we use compression reverb and delays is that the question eq reverb and compression yeah so broad broad EQ concept reverb. but yeah yeah um in a lot of many different ways um i mean you know i think with reverbs maggie touched on this earlier there's some really sweet um, Atmos enabled reverbs where you can use traditional bus sends to a 712 return channel, um, which will give you like an, an immersive um, reverb that kind of fills the whole room equally. Um, in addition to that, you can use traditional reverb, stereo reverb channels or return channels and have those placed in different areas, which can, you know, have more localized uh, returns, reverb returns. Um, I, I know that there's some really cool techniques people have done with stereo um, reverb channels and having different, you know, auxiliary return channels placed in different parts of the room, and you can kind of adjust the sends to those in different ways. So maybe you're hitting the front or the rear or the sides of the overheads more than other spaces. So you have a localized return as well as, you know, lower return in different areas as you adjust it to your taste. Um, so that's a good one, uh, I think, to cover some reverb stuff. If Maggie wants to comment on any any of the other topics there, yeah, um, I mean, feel free. definitely agree with everything you said about reverb for compression. I think the biggest challenge, probably with Atmos, is like bus compression and trying to figure out how to apply that to a full mix, um, which is obviously something that's like super established in stereo and channel-based mixing. So. Luke, actually, you taught me how to do this, but <laughs> the sort of workaround that has been like working for me is using, um, if you go like into groups and Pro Tools, and I just say this as a Pro Tools user, unfortunately, that's the only DAW I can speak to, but um, you can use sort of like the global attributes, I believe, to sort of um, unify a compressor on a common insert, basically. Um, I'm not really explaining that very well, but I usually put like a compressor, a limiter, and an EQ um, in like one of my three of my last five um, insert slots um, in my sessions and that way using this group function by controlling just one of the plugins I can apply like the same amount of compression or limiting to each track in the mix and that's sort of the best approximation of compression of sort of like full mix compression and limiting that um, I've been able to come up with that I, uh, that I think Luke has been able to come up with so far 
Um, but I think it has been really helpful to help kind of glue um, elements of the mix together and make it sound just a little bit more mastered, in my opinion. So I don't know if Luke, if you want to say anything more about that as well. Yeah, there's some other cool techniques that folks have been using, like object um, object busing. And so you can use a 712 um, bus, sending different elements to different parts of that bus, which then have group compression on the entire bus. And then those get fanned out to different object channels. So you can actually have now all these different object returns, so to speak, that are kind of compressed and glued together, which has kind of been a commonly used um, technique in more recent uh, years or months or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, and, and you know, the global control settings are, are a really good one, especially for applying a similar EQ across a mix or, um, or dynamic control like Maggie said. Um, yeah, and there, you know, there's, there's, there's more and more techniques being developed all the time. That's what's really exciting about Atmos is there's, there's, um, People are experimenting and trying new things. And then what's really cool is when somebody comes up with a cool idea and then it gets shared across um, different communities and, and um, adopted and become part of, you know, more, uh, more commonly used workflows. So that's really fun to, to watch those things get developed over time. Great, thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of this session. Our time is up. Um, Thank you to my guests, Brian Pennington, Maggie Tobin, Luke Argilla, for your amazing insight and wisdom. Um, thank you to everyone that's joined this session. We will post it up on our uh, Dolby Professional site soon and on our YouTube page. Thank you for all of the questions that were submitted. We will try to get around to answering some of those offline as well. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Uh